Morning, Rob. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. glad the sun's out again. I know. Don't know how long it'll morning. last, but all good here. Yeah, lovely <laughs> in Devon. Lovely, good. Um, now we've asked on social media this week on Facebook and on Instagram um, what people want to hear in these podcasts and if there's anything that's important to them, um, any topics that they want us to cover. And we've had a, quite a lot of feedback, but a number of people have asked about physical symptoms and they want us to have a chat about being an emetophobe and having physical symptoms. Um, and I thought that's actually really interesting because when I was an emetophobe myself for all those years, um, I had a range of physical symptoms and they were at different at different times. So when I was young, obviously, you know, my emetophobia started when I was around seven. Um, I would often just feel nauseous all of a sudden. I'd feel suddenly ill when I was going to go out somewhere, for example, or have to eat my tea. I would feel ill. Okay. And I didn't link anxiety or anything at all to do with these symptoms. I just thought, oh gosh, I'm ill. Okay. Or I feel right. sick. Okay. So I didn't, I didn't link the two. Now so I just went to clarity, through... when you say, just for clarity, when you say ill, you mean you feel sick? I feel sick. Yes. I just, okay. I felt nauseous. I All had right. the, the tightness in my throat. Um, I'd get that lump in your stomach kind of feeling. Um, and I, I would feel that quite regularly, daily. Now I went through um, what I presumed at the time was food poisoning, but I don't, I don't know if it was anymore. Okay. Um, I had flu around in April. I don't know which year it was, but I had flu. And then after I'd had that flu and obviously my immune system was very low, I went out for tea and um, I was ill that night twice. I was, I was physically sick that night twice. Um, and after that, for nine or 10 months, I felt ill to the point of going to the doctors every day. So I would okay. feel physically sick every day. I would shake, I would sweat. I had IBS type symptoms. I had a lot of diarrhea, upset stomach, cramping. Um, and after I'd been to the doctors for blood tests upon blood tests and endoscopies, both ways, um, delightful, and scans and all sorts of different things, they ruled out anything medical and they said to me, it's anxiety, which I was firmly sure that it wasn't at the time. And I was okay. aghast that they wouldn't do anything else medical for me. Um, so I totally understand these questions that we've got from social media. Um, and I thought it would be a really good topic to discuss today. Um, so I'm just going to ask you yeah. if um, you don't mind talking about that. And I wonder if you could talk about why people with emetophobia, and it's a really sad irony, but why people with emetophobia feel physically ill and have these physical symptoms more often than people without it. Okay. I think the same thing every week with these things. It seems such a simple question. Yes. You know, when I, when I get an email from you or from Joe or from wherever saying, oh, can we talk about this? Well, yes. And you think, God, that's so simple. But actually, it's, as always, it's really complex. And it's always a, a, a really important question, right? Yeah. Because 99%, I would say, and I'm making that figure up, right? I would say that probably higher than 99% of all nausea type, anxiety type symptoms that emetophobes have, have nothing whatsoever to do with being sick mm. and are created by them worrying and feeling anxious and then misreading or misunderstanding the symptoms that they have and assuming that they're going to be sick. Yeah. So to explain that, and you have to take a step back, as we always do, and think about, well, why do people create feelings of nausea and, and dryness of throat and anxiety and panic and fainting and mm -hmm. clammy and all and all of those other horrible feelings okay so yeah. anybody that suffers from anxiety or or intense stress can experience those symptoms they, they yes. are common symptoms of anxiety panic stress all right so it's the person overly worrying, uh, um, overly brooding, feeling anxious, doubting, creating fear and anxiety, that kind of, oh, my God, I, I couldn't cope response. And if you think about it, think about a non-emetophobe for a minute. Anybody that is reacting to what feels like a, a genuine threat you know, I'm sitting here talking to now. If I see two masked gunmen walk past my window to my door, okay, mm -hmm. I am going to think exactly the same as an emetophobe would think. Yeah. 
I'm not going to swear on the podcast, but no. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, oh, my God, this is awful. This is the worst thing in the world. We're all going to die. I can't cope. Yes. Okay? And yep. immediately you're going to – everything's going to tighten up. You're going to yep. feel full of anxiety and stressed and potentially blurred vision, all that kind of things. All right. Yes. So yep. those are common reactions to a perceived threat. Now, the only difference is that if I've got two masked gunmen at my front door – Mine isn't a perceived threat, it's a genuine threat. Yes. As we know, what a metaphobe has done um, is essentially, over a period of time, taught themselves to overreact mm -hmm. to a, a very small threat, or perceived threat, that's just built up and up and up to the point where it feels for them very, very similar to what it feel to me if there was someone trying to shoot me at my door. Yeah. Okay. It, it, you know, it feels like a genuine threat, and of course, then they react to what feels like a genuine threat. Yes. So, forget forget everything else to one side for a minute. Why does it feel so bad? Because to them, the threat is real. Mm -hmm. Okay. The feelings, the thoughts, the doubts, the worries, the anxiety they experience is a hundred percent real, and it's yeah. exactly the same. As if someone's pointing a gun at me. Yep. Okay. Or the doctor says, I'm sorry, your results are back. It's cancer. We're in trouble, Rob. Yeah. Okay. You are flooded with all that adrenaline and cortisone and all those other hormones and things, and you are just terrified. Yeah. Now, in those two cases, your terror is perhaps justified, but how do you know? Mm -hmm. How does anyone know? We, 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 we base our um, experiences, we base our fight or flight response, we base our knowledge on our feelings. So if my feelings tell me that this is terrifying, mm -hmm. I believe my feelings. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's the whole issue with really any phobia, but particularly emetophobia. People are believing their feelings yes. and acting upon their feelings as if their feelings were an accurate um, portrayal of a threat. Yeah. I'm feeling terrified, therefore it must be terrifying. Yes. Instead of slowly challenging that and saying, well, hang on, how terrifying is it? Let's just yeah. break it down a little bit. They just react to the terror, as anybody else would do. Yes. Right. Yeah. So what happens then, the average emetophobe is, is living a life full of anxiety, mm -hmm worrying anxious anxiously every day and of course as we know uh, uh, most emetophobes are quite external in their emotions particularly around illness and what that means for anyone who's listening who doesn't hasn't read a manual or anything we're talking about locus of control yeah. so they are perceiving that their emotions are happening to them OK, just like in any phobia, if I've got a phobia of spiders and I'm sitting here now looking at that spider and I feel really anxious and terrified, I believe wholeheartedly that that spider is making me feel this way. Yes. OK, so I'm giving an external attribution to what I'm feeling. Yep. OK, and at that moment, you're screwed. Yep. Because the moment you believe that that thing is causing, the only thing I can do is run away from that spider. OK, mm -hmm. only when I start to realize, you know what, it's not the spider making me feel this way. It's the way I am reacting to the spider because of different thinking styles and different beliefs. Then you start to feel more powerful yeah. and you start to think, well, hang on a sec. Although I'm really effing anxious at the moment, I know that I am doing this. So I do know on some level that it's not the spider. So I'm going to sit here and I'm going to try and calm down and try and get my head around it, get some perspective. And you slowly uh, take back that control. So that's the first thing. The first thing is the moment an emetophobe feels nauseous, they automatically give it an external attribution, i.e. Yeah. they automatically believe it's happening to them yeah. or, or even their body is causing them to feel that way. That's still external yes. in the yeah. true sense of it, right? And so they believe, therefore, it's a sign that they're going to be sick. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And then, of course... They worry even more because they're feeling nauseous, and that that 
unhelpful cycle just means they stay locked in this loop of feeling anxious and, or, and nauseous yeah. all day, every day, yeah. and not knowing how to change it. So that's the first reason why they feel that way. It's understandable that any stressed or anxious or phobic person would generate uh, lots of stress-related st- symptoms and stomach-related symptoms, even things like irritable bowel and all those sorts of things, right? Mm-hmm. And um, acid reflux and all, all those sorts of things because they're living in a perpetual state of anxiety, okay? Yes. And then when they have those symptoms, they give them an external attribution. Yes. They believe there's a genuine reason why they're feeling that way. That's the yep. first thing. Yeah. The second thing is that most emetophobes um, – well, to have a metaphobia in the first place means you're terrified of this thing, okay? If you're terrified of something, if I'm terrified um, of people coming to my door at the moment because there are masked gunmen roaming the neighbourhood, yep. I'm going to be really anxious about anyone coming to my door, aren't I? Yes. If I hear the doorbell go, I'm not going to think, oh, it's probably just my neighbour. I'm yeah. going to think, what if it's these masked gunmen? Yeah. So you automatically sensibly almost assume the worst the whole time yes so just for that reason alone and your desire for control and and the negativity Mm. surround uh, um your beliefs about sickness anything at all that remotely remotely could be related to the fact that i might be sick i'm going to assume is a real thing yes so every time that an emetophobe feels nauseous they are going to automatically assume, sensibly, you could mm-hmm. argue, assume mm-hmm. that this means there's something going on in my stomach. I've eaten something. I, I, I'm going to be sick. Yes. And what they're not doing, they're not processing the fact that they felt this way every day for the last nine months and they haven't been sick at all. Yeah. Because even if they did process that, they would still think, well, it doesn't mean today it's not r- real. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, and mm-hmm. that's living in that in that, that cycle of, of thinking, right? So it's for, it's you know it's it's difficult, and that's why it's the hardest phobia to live with. Yes, because you are constantly reacting and overreacting mm-hmm. to thought processes and feelings that you have generated inside yourself. Yeah, but believe they've come from outside of yourself. Yes. yes. Yeah. Be- mm-hmm. believe, believing is real like any other phobia they believe it is real yes and then they are reacting to that perceived threat by creating lots of anxiety and creating anxiety related symptoms which they then perceive to be a genuine threat as well and then overreact to that yep and which is why then they start to eat less yep. why things like anorexia are often comorbid symptoms for metaphobes other eating disorders, comorbid symptoms from metaphobe. Yeah. Um, health anxiety, comorbid symptoms from metaphobe. Excuse me. IBS, all, all these sorts of symptoms. It makes perfect sense that yeah. if you're if you're worrying anxiously all the time, you just feel terrified and you're just yeah. exhausted. Yes. The yes. whole time. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, and and the hard, and don't forget the hardest thing also is you know most of the research. And certainly our experience suggests that um, emetophobes are bright, dr- brighter than average people, yeah. uh, um, driven, focused, successful people, yeah. generally speaking, in every other area of their life. Okay, mm-hmm. And that, of course, makes it worse. Yeah. Because what that means is they, they, they pretty much feel they've got good control mm-hmm. over every other area of their life. Yes. Um. And so this one area where they feel they've got no control just seems so much bigger because yes. everything else is bolted down for them mm-hmm. other yeah. than this area. The irony would be if a metaphobes actually had genuine learned helplessness, their emetophobia would probably go. Mm. So in other words, if they stopped trying if they just gave up trying to avoid being sick etc and they thought there's yeah. nothing i can do i'm totally powerless i'm just going to give in to this thing yeah they'd probably be over it in a few days yeah. yeah because remember that it's not a real threat 
mm-hmm. as in it's not, you know, they're not going to die. Yeah. It's not going to kill them. They will cope. Yes. They always cope. Even though they think they won't, they always cope. And so actually, the moment you stop worrying for whatever reason, on this occasion by giving up because you just feel so hopeless, yeah. ironically, your symptoms would disappear. Yeah. So that desire for control and the want to control it and the want to get through it and the drive to overcome it is, uh, 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 and the, that strong desire for control is one of the things that actually perpetuates it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a long answer, isn't it? It's a long answer, but it's a very good one. I liked okay. it. Um, I just wanted to add to it a little bit. I found it incredibly hard to accept when I was an emetophobe, right? When that doctor said to me, after all those tests, these physical symptoms, this shaking, this tightness in your throat, that lump that's constantly there, this churning in your stomach, all of that, you're causing it, right? I found that incredibly, it was a hard pill to swallow, metaphorically, and I didn't want to believe it for a long time. I fought it and I said, no, the doctors are wrong. There must be something. They've missed something. Why do you think that is? Well, that was going to be my question to you, but I could try and answer it. (laughs) Um, Why do I think that is? Um, Partly because of what you've just said, okay? Partly because I was able and skilled in every other area of my life and I thought, well, if I could have stopped this by now, why wouldn't I? Of course I would have done. I clung completely out of my control because I've been trying to stop feeling this way for such a long time and I've been trying to sort myself out for such a long time that I would have done it by now because I'm able to do that and solve all these problems and put fires out in every other area of my life of course I would have sorted this out by now if it was me so clearly it can't be me but also there's a need to believe that it's something outside of myself to avoid that vulnerable feeling of god it is me okay because that that's gut-wrenching to know that you've put yourself through so much suffering for such a long time, completely, completely inadvertently and not knowing that you're doing it. But that's really hard to accept. So holding and maintaining the belief that it's happening to you is almost a protective measure. It's, it's kind of protecting your self-esteem a little bit. Okay, so, so on that note for a moment then, mm. so you're protecting your self-esteem. Yeah. So this so this links to the whole social anxiety thing again. Massively. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, you know, I've talked before, I, I remember taking a um a, a, a person with me type symptoms uh, uh through the thrive program years ago and they started to get significantly better and it looked like it looked like any moment now it was going to go completely yeah. and then they, they stopped putting effort in and we had a conversation about it and this particular chap said i'd rather have his symptoms till the day he dies than for his friends and family to think that he was some kind of malingerer and yeah. that was creating it all himself, okay? Yeah. Because the sense of judgment, he imagined them all standing around him, him going, my symptoms are gone, I've got my life back. And they go, oh, that's fantastic. What was causing it? Oh, it was me. I was doing it to myself. <laughs> you what? Yeah. I've been pushing you around in a chair for the last 20 years and it yeah. was all you. Yeah. So that this is another reason why we keep reiterating the fact that to overcome a metaphobia our way at least you have to learn to thrive yeah. and what that means is you're not just focusing on overcoming this phobia you are overcoming social anxiety okay mm. you are building high stable self-esteem yes and when you have high sta- stable self-esteem and real good social confidence you stop worrying mm. what other people think so mm. it'd be much harder for you for example had we, had we taken you through a bit of the Thrive program years ago before mm-hmm. this happened, and all we focused on was giving you lots of social confidence and high stable self esteem, you wouldn't yeah. have felt like that. No, you would have found it much easier to when the doctor said to you, "This is anxiety. You're doing this to yourself." You'd have gone, "Okay, oh. what do I do about that, doctor?" Yeah, and he yeah. may have referred. Do you know what I mean? Instead of yeah. resisting it, so that that that's one part of it. It's the, it's the not wanting it to be my fault. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But also, don't forget. Also, most emetophobes are perfectionists. They already beat themselves up. They are, they are, really quite moral, uh, uh, focused, community orientated. There's lots of research around 
people with an obsessive side to their nature that says that, that that obsessive people have a higher than normal level of moral and ethical development and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, yep. So it's harder for that person, especially if you've been suffering something for years, to go, oh, I'm doing it to myself. Yeah, it was me. But mm. actually, that should be empowering. If you think about it, it should that be, should yeah. be empowering. Yeah. That should be great. Yeah. I'm doing it. It's not out there. It's not a bogeyman out there coming to get me. Yeah. I'm doing it. Doc, what do I do? How, yeah. how, what do I need to do? Yeah. So that's another part of it. Also, most emetophobes, if we say, have got a, a, a quite a strong desire for control, and they're usually pretty much in control, and they tend to have a high level of belief about their self-efficacy, okay? So they don't believe it's them. No. Just, just purely purely on the, the the preponderance of probability why why would it be me yes i'm I'm a clever driven yeah. motivated person i'm up at six o'clock in the morning i go to the gym for an hour before i go to work every day and i got you know yeah. i got three kids you know you know I, I just don't believe that i would do it to myself yes yeah um uh, and uh why else well i think probably primarily because when someone has a high level of desire for control, you tend to get used to relying on, for example, safety-seeking behaviours. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. a safety-seeking behaviour, here's a question for you right in front of all of your followers, right? What do you think the biggest safety-seeking behaviour is for a emetophobe? That's a horrible question, right? That's a the horrible biggest... question. Is it not different for every emetophobe? No. I might be wrong. No. Ooh. The biggest safety seeking behaviour. Think think more think more laterally. I'm not talking necessarily about the normal safety seeking behaviours like hand washing and checking dates and things like that. Think think yeah. more globally. What do they rely on most to give them guidance in their life? <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. I fully understand the question, but I guess outside influences, outside things to give them guidance. So other people, they'd, they'd look to and, other and, people. And, and, and how does it give them guidance? They look what? to other people to see how they should respond. Yeah. No, I've missed the point. You, you, I've, you, I've, no, 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 you get, you're, you're in the right area. I'll, 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 I'll let you off. <laughs> They're emotions. They're emotions. They're feelings. Right. Yeah. The the most common thing, not just metaphobes, but but anyone with a high desire for control mm -hmm. reacts to is how they feel. Right. They've got a higher than normal level of belief that what they're experiencing yeah. is is genuine. Yeah. Or 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 is a threat or should be listened to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I'm 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 feeling that there's, you know. There's something dodgy about that guy that works at the chip shop, okay? Yeah. Just a feeling I've got, right? They are more likely to have a stronger belief about that feeling than somebody else that may have just had the same feeling and wafted it away, Yeah. okay? okay. So they, yeah. they want, don't forget, they want to feel more in control. Yeah. So they're looking all the time for, for cues and clues that they are in control or they're going to be in control or they're going out of control. Yeah. And the most common thing then is how they feel. Yes. And they believe how they feel and they overbelieve it because it gives them this illusion of control. Yeah. Okay. You go to, you have normal control, you have a desire for control. And if you push it to the nth degree, excuse me. Yep. It's this illusion of control. They're attempting to over control or overestimate things yep. in order to make themselves feel better. Yep. For example, I don't think that there's very, very, very little evidence to suggest that eating something that is a few days out of its sell by date is any threat to mm -hmm. anyone at all in terms of being sick, right? In fact, yep. I think the, the big supermarket is just about to stop doing all that stuff, right? Yeah. But, but, because you want to feel more in control, you'll absolutely believe that. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to rigidly stick to, I'm never going to eat anything that's an hour past its eat by yeah. date because yes. that's helping me feel more in control. I mean, yes. it's not actually adding anything. Yeah. Yeah. Not adding anything. 
Yes. You know, and, and like emetophobes quite often really believe that their their hand washing and their cleansing rituals mm-hmm. are the things that have saved them from catching yep. a bug. Yep. Because that because it's something they can physically see. What they don't realise is they don't get a bug because they got things in their body that keeps them fit and healthy. Yes. It's yeah. not the fact that they wash their hands 20 times a day. But yeah. that's something that they can do to make themselves feel better. In the same way, I knew this was going to be a big one, in the same way <laughs> that obsessive people or people with OCD might check the doors locked yeah. and then go back and check it again yeah. and then think, hang on a sec, what, what if I checked it and it wasn't completely shut? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Their anxiety and stress that they're experiencing today has nothing whatsoever to do with whether the door is locked or not, right? It's a, they're stressing about something else, but yes. they're looking for something to do. What can I do to make me feel more in control? Yeah. I can check that the door's locked. I can check that I didn't leave the rollers on at home. I can yeah. uh, check the brakes on the car before I drive today. Yep. They're looking for things that they can do to to make them feel, make themselves believe they feel more in, more in control yes yes and that and that and the, the prime thing then is believing your emotions yeah don't forget the other the other aspect of that is when we looked at all the research around memory particularly mm-hmm. and so the other thing that that uh, that a metaphor or anyone with a strong desire for control is more prone to doing is having more faith more belief in their memories yeah. you know that they would they 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 could you know bet money that that guy that was at the, you know, the DJ was called Dave everyone else saying no it was Simon it was Simon no no yeah. no I'm absolutely I remember I'm absolutely certain yeah. they like to have more certainty in their life yes. so they like to feel more certain yeah. and so they've trained themselves to feel more certain all that all that uh, um research around memory particularly around in, in forensic situations says that if you have two people in a in a car crash mm. and they're in court giving evidence and uh, and one person says do you know what i think i think it was a i think it was a blue ford fiesta mm. and the other person says i'm absolutely certain it was a white yeah volkswagen polo yeah the person that's absolutely certain is no more likely to be correct than yes. the person that's got a vague recollection. Just because they're certain doesn't ha, has no relation to whether they're right or not. Yeah. And in certain circumstances, the person that's more certain is actually more likely to be wrong. Yes. Yep. Okay. So they believe they believe their emotions. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, feelings aren't facts. Yeah. But my life is so full of anxiety and stress and perceived threats. I've got to, I've got to follow some guidelines. I've got to, I've got to follow some hints. Yeah. And haven't been sick for five years, so my hand washing and my emotions must be helpful yeah. in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they overestimate the influence of their um, safety seeking behaviours. One of which is their reliance upon the belief in their emotions. Right. Okay. That's a long answer, wouldn't it? Again, very good answer. Sorry. Very, very good. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I wonder if we could talk a minute then about body scanning, because mm-hmm. a lot of my clients, um, certainly at least four of them at the moment, are doing a lot of body scanning and they are continuously checking and they are using that as a measure as to whether they're getting better or not. So they are yep. saying, okay, well, I'm, I'm you know, I've, I've, I was checked this morning. I didn't feel anxious this morning, but by lunchtime I was feeling really anxious, and that's because they're continuously scanning their body and going, "Do is my throat tight, or have I got this feeling in my stomach, or oh, do I need have I got cramps?" They're continuously looking for that anxiety symptoms that they physical symptoms that they generate, and yeah. and hope if, and hoping hoping that they're not there, yeah. but fearing that they are there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So inevitably they start to generate them, but they don't link the two. They don't link the fact that they are continuously looking for a physical symptom and therefore ultimately create a physical symptom. They don't link those two things in their brain. They don't see them as connected. Okay, no. So they, they see that the, the physical symptoms just appeared and I've been looking for these things as completely separate 
yes. one doesn't cause the other. One isn't yeah. linked to the other. And I was just wondering, is is that something worth exploring as to why they don't connect the two? Why did I not, for all those years, connect the fact that I was continuously hoping and wishing and praying for some part of it that I didn't feel ill that day, and then I was feeling much more ill than everybody else around me? Yeah. Why did I not okay. connect those two well, things? Part, partly for the same reasons we talked about a minute ago in terms of not recognising that you know physical symptoms of nausea are more likely to be, you know, symptoms of anxiety and, yeah. and the worry and you're creating them. But in terms of body scanning, so when someone's body scanning, it, it's a symptom of the desire for control again. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm out there looking. Stick with my ridiculous analogy of earlier on. That's like me sitting at the bedroom window with a pair of binoculars looking yeah. for these these this roving band of muggers, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. how am I going to feel? If I think, oh, it's a, it's, it's a sensible thing to do to go and, and, and watch out for these muggers. Why? Because it'd be terrifying if they got here. So mm-hmm. forewarned is, is, is forearmed. So I'm going to go looking for them yep. to try and reduce you know, the impact of it. So how am I going to be feeling when I'm sitting up in the bedroom window with these binoculars? I'm creating anxiety, aren't I? Yeah. That, that's, that's all I'm doing. Yep. What's that? What's that movement over there? Who's that? What's going on there? Where are they yeah. going? Oh, God, they've gone next door. Oh, it's only the postman. So really any any action undertaken because of, of an excessive desire for control is only going to create anxiety. Yes. Excuse me. It's only going to create anxiety. So mm-hmm. recognizing recognizing when you are acting on behalf of your guard dog and not out of out of sensibility. For example, like most people, I lock my doors at night, mm-hmm. okay? But I don't lock my doors because I'm terrified. Yeah. I don't lock my, lock my doors and peer through the curtain because I'm I'm scared of being mugged or I'm scared of being burgled or anything like that. I lock the doors because it's an easy thing to do and you're staying safe. There's no anxiety involved mm-hmm. at all. It's, it's a sensible precaution. In the same way as a non-emetophobe might sensibly wash their hands before having dinner. When I wash my hands before dinner, I'm not thinking, oh, my God, I've got to scrub it just in case. Yes. It's just a sensible yeah. thing to do. So yeah. any action that an emetophobe performs that while performing it, they are they are creating anxious thoughts mm-hmm. is going to generate anxiety. Yes. Okay. And then yeah. the very thing they're looking for you know, a couple of hours later, they feel nauseous and anxious. They're like, God, I knew it was there. Yeah. And they're just not putting the two together. Yeah. So, again, another reason why it's learned to thrive to overcome hematophobia. So a real good awareness of their thinking styles, mm-hmm. uh, um, their, their common behaviours around the way they think, you know. So if, if, I'm, um, if I'm really worried uh that my wife might be having an affair mm-hmm. but i also know that i'm a big brooder i can go come on rob look you know you're a big brooder you know you're a worrier you have to take that into account okay yes yeah but if i also know that i'm not a brooder at all yeah and i'm i'm not prone to catastrophizing things yeah the evidence i think i'm seeing may be more valid yeah so knowing yourself, knowing what I'm like, yes, yeah, and understanding myself, it is the greatest. You know, knowledge is power, isn't it? It's the yeah. greatest yeah. skill set a person can have. The yes. more you know and understand yourself, yeah, the the better your life is going to be, and, and the more equipped you are, the more better equipped you are to respond to situations and pressures and stresses in life in in a helpful way because you know what you're like. You know yes. what you're likely to be doing. Yeah, 100%. Okay? And anything that you're doing because your guard dog, your 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 desire for control has said, you know, go and check that door's locked. Mm-hmm. You know, go and do this. Check that sell by date again. Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, let's, you know, let's have a quick look at my body. You know, if someone's got health anxiety and their body's scanning every day and they look at that mole every day and they get out their little tape measure and they measure it, you know, just because they've been in the, the bath that morning, in a hot bath and their skin's expanded a little bit, the mole looks bigger. Yeah. 
Okay, then, oh my God, it wasn't that big yesterday. Let me check in my notes. No, it was only 2.3 millimeters yesterday. It's now 2.4. Yeah. So it, all of that generates anxiety because yeah. what, what you're doing, you're not. So if I body scan, which I probably do once every two years, when I feel a little bit older, I think I just better make sure there's no moles that shouldn't be there or, you know, check your breast for lumps and all this. Once I've got this, I don't do it full of anxiety. No. I don't no. go, crikey, I'd, I'd, better, I'd better check everything, make sure there's no new lumps or anything that's there. Phew. Yeah. I just do it the same way I check the door. It's a sensible thing to do. So if yeah. you're doing whatever you are doing, if you are doing it and thinking or feeling anxious at the same time, yeah. then, it's, then it's not helpful. Yes. You're yeah. only going to generate anxiety and and fear and you're going to create the very symptoms yes. that you're anxious about creating yeah. yeah and i think that's what you're talking about understanding that's key as well to even linking even the understanding that your thoughts are powerful enough to create physical symptoms in your body there is a massive link all backed up by research that what you think creates physical symptoms in your oh, body i know that i could i could make i i could say something to you now that would make the capillaries in your cheeks expand, draw blood to the surface, and you go deeply, deeply red and blush. Right. Yep. I'm not going to, okay? <laughs> but, but that's right. a thought yep. having a physical change. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, you know, it's, pe people, people do know this, but they just don't make the connections, the connections. For, for the reasons, yeah. you know, for, you know, sensible Everything in a metaphobe does is absolutely sensible and intelligent <laughs> if the threat was real. real. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If the yeah. threat was real, what they're doing is a sensible, intelligent yeah. threat reduction. You know, it would be silly for me while there's armed burglars and gunmen wandering around the village, okay, yeah. to not, as they're not at the door now, to not just go, just be the postman. That'd yeah. be that'd be remiss of me. That'd be a yeah. stupid thing to do, to not yeah. think, I wonder if that's them. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be a ridiculous thing for me to do, yeah. to put my guard down. Yeah. It's a ridiculous thing, thing for metaphobes to do, to put their guard down, yeah. if the threat was real. Yeah. Yeah. They are responding to how they feel about something. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. It's not it's not, they're not responding to what they believe is causing it. And the same thing goes for any phobia, right? Whether it's spiders, heights, darkness, yeah. cancer, anything, right? They're not responding to the actual event or the situation or the animal or the 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 event. Yeah. They are responding to the emotions they have generated about it and then they are believing their emotions. Yes. That's and the generation it. of physical symptoms is sensible if there's arm coming at the door. You need 100%. that of adrenaline. You need that stomach churn. I, w I would, I would, I would want situation. you. You would want that feeling because that feeling's telling you something's wrong. Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's telling you something's wrong, and and you know, millions and millions of years of evolution has has, has evolved us to the extent that that's a great warning system yep. for us. It's like a lighthouse. Yes. flashing a light warning us okay yeah. but what we have to understand is we have we have to we have to have a really clear unbiased um view of what the actual threat is instead mm -hmm. of just responding to it yes yeah we have to we have to look at it and think about it and and try and get a much better understanding of what the perceived threat is if you just believe it you'll stay anxious for the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah. And understanding yourself is key to that as well. So you have Absolutely. to understand your own thoughts and how you create that anxiety because everyone feels it differently physically. Yes. You know, you've got to understand yourself. So learning, understanding, gaining that knowledge about yourself is vital yes. to overcoming uh, uh, those physical symptoms. And, and, of course, and, of course, what people tend to do, because they are so, you know, it's a terrible metaphor, and I apologise to anyone who's watching has been burgled, right? But mm. 
what might I do then if I if I'm if I'm genuinely and sensibly mm. terrified of these people kicking my door in? I would be sensible to add some more locks to the doors. I'd be sensible mm -hmm. to get some TV cameras. I'd be sensible to get a guard dog. Mm -hmm. I'd be sensible to not go out and and lock all the windows and um, you know arm myself somehow. That those are those would be sensible, intelligent safety measures, yes. right? And yeah. then what happens, of course, because I'm so terrified and I'm grasping at anything to try and make myself feel better, the fact that I haven't been burgled for the last six months, I'm going to put down to the fact that I've got good locks on the doors yes. and the fact that I set up in the top bedroom. You know, I'm attributing my success to my safety-seeking activities, yes. which, of course, have absolutely nothing to do with it. No. Yep. Okay? But you're yep. building up your belief in... in, in the most unhelpful of all skill sets. Yes. Thinking that, you know, I'm I'm clever because by having all these locks on the doors and by spending 24 hours a day up in the room with binoculars, I prevented us from being burgled. Yeah. When it's just the fact that they've gone down that road instead of this road. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's the illusion of control. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 um, trying to trying to connect two completely separate events as somehow being connected you sometimes mm -hmm. see if you see someone a, a, a zebra crossing or something and they press the button for the lights to change and then they press it another five times uh, yes. trying to speed up okay and then when it changes they think oh my god i did that yeah <laughs> it was me i did that yeah. they they want to believe mm -hmm. they have more influence than they have Yes. Because that sense of power relaxes anxiety. The more powerful yeah. you feel, the less anxious you're going to feel. Yeah. You see it in lifts sometimes. Don't you? you press the you know, fl floor three, press the button, nothing happens. You go over to it again, you go, and the door closes. And there's a part of you that thinks, oh, I did, that. I did that. Yeah. Okay. Because you want to feel more powerful in those situations. That's the yeah. illusion of control. So, again, yes much safer much more sensible to only process obviously genuine experiences um particularly things one of the things we do in the program is you know around self-esteem is, is the is the um our our list of positives you know you're listing down you're demonstrating ways in which you are building your self-esteem and, and ways in which you deserve to have good self-esteem and you mm. deserve to feel good about yourself and it's your right to feel good about yourself by by writing those things down and reminding yourself of them you're making sure they get processed yeah you're making sure they really sink in yeah yeah mm -hmm. going back one minute in terms of emotions for a moment then and maybe this is a whole new podcast right next time it's really funny because even non-emetophobes quite often tend to just have faith in their emotions for for real no no real reason at all no mm -hmm. evidence mm -hmm. to them that 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 their experiences are are, are helpful or or have contributed to a successful life for them in any way kind of shape or form and it's a bias right they're picking yeah. on the ones they want to pick on to confirm what they're thinking. But if you think about yeah. this, this is horrible and I apologize, right? But if you think about how sad you felt all those years ago when your first boyfriend dumped you mm -hmm. and you felt your heart torn open wide and you thought it's the end of the world and you thought you're never over, okay? That's absolutely no different to when you were in the cinema last week and you saw a sad film. Yep. Okay. That's a yep. film. It's not real. Yeah. It's not real. Or a song. Yes. Or you read a poem. Yeah. Or a story that someone else tells you. Or it's a wonderful picture. If or you, the John if you Lewis go Chris to a, it. Or that. Okay. <laughs> you go and yep. see a sad film and you cry. I always cry if I see that bit at the end of the film, um, Love Actually, where they're all yeah. coming into the airport 
I, yeah. I could if I even thought about it for two minutes now I could probably develop a tear right yeah. that's a that's a genuine combination of sadness and uh, um I guess on some level feeling sorry for yourself or something okay yeah. but it's not real it's a film yeah, it's yeah. a film okay yeah. what I'm trying to say is the generation of emotion has nothing to do with the reality of your life yeah. necessarily yeah. necessarily okay yeah the, yeah. the 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 anger I feel watching a film about the Holocaust might be the same type of anger I generate when I see an old lady on the street being mistreated. Mm-hmm. Okay, yep. I am gener I am generating these yes. feelings for some yep. reason. That reason might be a, a, a valid, sensible thing to do, or it might just be in my head. Yeah, I might have been daydreaming about something. Okay. Yep. Why we believe our emotions as strongly as most of us do is is uh, you know is a mystery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think possibly again it all comes back to a, a lack of understanding. We're not taught that our emotions we create them. You know, we're not taught that they are something we are actively doing in the moment. Society, I suppose, is is particularly external. You know, in this blame culture of I, this person said this to me, therefore I feel this way. Therefore, what they have said has made me feel this way. Yes. So that is how I judge life and events in life is is what's going on out there. Therefore, I feel, and how I feel, therefore, is the measure of how bad or good that thing was. So that's that's possibly how we're brought up. It's probably possibly a societal yeah, thing. That's the way society focuses, and there's lots of you know, there's lots of language around. You know, uh, um, you know. Oh, she's got a lot of grief coming up at the moment. You know, oh, yeah, a lot of anger, her uncle yeah. died. She's got a lot. She's got a lot of anger coming up at the moment, as if somehow yeah. the anger's all there inside her, stored up. And because yeah. uncle's died, the cork's been taken out of the bottle, and so all this emotion is coming out. Yeah. We, we know that's not true. We know we know yeah. that it's the way you're thinking about something, the way you're responding to something that generates the emotion. But that, yeah. that's a, that's a good start point around thinking about why you believe your emotions mm-hmm. and, be- yeah. and believe the depth of those emotions as well yeah. yes. and respond to the depth of those feelings. That, that's, a, that's a really good start point for people to think about. Yeah, brilliant. And the start of another podcast, start I would say. Podcast. Brilliant. Yeah. So I think we should uh, possibly leave that one there. I think we've covered a lot of ground there um, and we'll um, do another podcast on the emotions, I think. That'd be a good one. Yes, one quick thing then, trying mm. to be help, trying to be helpful. Yes. How do you? How would you know? You're sitting at home one day, and you're feeling nauseous, mm. and you don't know whether it's an anxiety yep. response or a genuine thing. Yep. Do whatever you can do to calm yourself down, mm-hmm. whatever that is, and when you know that you are now calm and your thinking is calm, and your heart rate is slowed, and you're feeling quite calm, if the nausea goes, you know it's stress-related. Yeah, yeah. That That's the litmus test. Yeah. You know, it, and it's a very, very simple test. I know it's hard to do when you're feeling anxious, right? This is why it's so important that you don't just dive into it and go with the feelings and emotions. Yeah. This is why it's so important that you you, you stop yourself and you take a step back and you get some perspective and you do everything you can do to calm yourself down. Yeah. Because if when you've calmed down, the nausea stops, you know that you were creating it. Yes. Yes. That's the test. 100%. Yeah. And I suppose All the right. ultimate, yeah, yeah. The ultimate goal there is to cope, actually to get to the point where it doesn't matter whether it's your anxiety causing it or whether you're actually ill because you'll cope so that's the ultimate goal because if you, uh, uh, you know uh, yes, you'll cope, yeah and it's and it's and it's a a, a a um paradox really if you think about it because emetophobes like any other phobic person is creating the phobia by the way in which they're thinking about the event so the yeah. moment they start to think they would cope they stop creating anxiety anyway if i think i'd cope why am i going to panic yeah, if I if I think oh, I'm I'm expecting a letter any day now from the Inland Revenue saying I owe them five thousand pounds in tax, right? If I think that's okay, I'll cope with that. Yeah. I'm not going to generate anxiety about it. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a it's paradoxical in that respect, but 
essentially when we help people to overcome metaphobia, what they are doing is they are slowly building up their own skill set, which then reduces their perceived threat from this massive thing to a really, really small thing. No different to what most other people think about it. That might happen. I might be sick once in the next two or three years. And if I do, be unpleasant for five minutes, but I'll cope. But it's not going to affect my life. That's it. Once yeah. you feel that way about it, you stop worrying. You do. And then you stop getting all the physical symptoms every day, which is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. Lovely. Lovely. Right. Nice to see you. Thank nice you very much. Nice to see you too. See you next week. You're see welcome. you next week. Okay. Cheerio. Bye-bye.